I asked Todd to come back to talk about um, his work uh, with SmartFin. Um, and I mentioned to some of you, it's a, um, a device that attaches to a surfboard. It's a fin for a surfboard um, that collects data. And um, so he's going to talk to us about that interface, the kind of work that um, SmartFin is doing with other surfers and other uh, organizations, and about this interface between um, technology and uh, saving the Earth or something. Um, it's true. So SmartFin, um, so are there any surfers in the audience? Anybody surf? Oh, where are you from? I'm Jason. Uh-huh. So as you know, um, surfboard fins come on and off, and um, there's a lot of different kinds. And talking to a group that's only one surfer is a big pleasure for me too, because I almost always am talking to surfers. And when I say smart fin, they say, what fin profile are you gonna make? Oh my God, that's the conversation we're gonna have? <laughs> like, you know, it goes straight to equipment, it goes straight to performance. And the surfing world is big in equipment and performance. Uh, so I start the project right off with that challenge that if you're going to make something for a high performance sport, you have to be ready to, to offer something that lives in that world well. Because that's your way in. But the trick is to find a way in to a community and then see what you can do with the community once you've been accepted. So you don't say, oh my god, that's the question we're going to have. You say, oh, I, I don't know, how can you help me figure out what fin profile to make? What it is that would serve the most surfers? Um, who do you think will ride it? Stuff. So what the fin does is um, it's got a contactless battery for charging. It's got sensors. It, it, it takes temperature data to a crazy, crazy level of accuracy, 0.00000. Um, it's got a quick uh, return rate, so if the temperature changes in you know, less than a second, it's, it's picking up. Uh, very quick temperature shifts. It um, tracks the motion of the surfer and it records everything that that means. So speed, direction, distance. Uh, it, it records the force of the wave, how strong is the wave, how many waves come, uh, how tall is the wave because it's measuring GPS too. So it's got it's got a you know multi-access thing. And it, um, the use of the word thing should clue you into something. Um, so, uh, why, how, why would I be behind this project is, uh, is a legitimate question. And there's, there's actually uh, really two questions that everybody asks when they hear about SmartFin. So the first thing is, you know, they find out what it does, and I just told you what it does, and that leads to two questions. It's always, and it usually follows cool. Like, there's usually an immediate cool, and then two questions. Well, the immediate cool is important. I have to be honest with you. If you don't have an immediate cool in this world, you're in real trouble because it's very hard to get people's attention without an immediate cool. Like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and then, then anybody who's thinking about it asks you, how did you come up with the idea? And what good is it actually going to do? Both of those questions belie the important questions. And I, I just told Amy, I don't normally speak about SmartFan. I let other people do that. And the reason I do that is everyone I talk to is in the promotional zone. They want to promote it, they want to tell the story of it, and they're asking for two things. They're asking for one, that you're some kind of brilliant inventor who come up, came up with this great idea, and two, your brilliant idea is going to save the world, aren't we lucky to have you here? Right? Both of those answers to the questions is what everybody wants the answer. That's the that next sentence. You see that right? That's what people want you to tell them. And that's what they want to tell their audience. They want to tell their audience that because they want to attract a lot of eyes on the project so they can tell, sell a lot of advertising for what the company is. We all know that Google is an advertising company. That's what they are. It's important always to remember that. And anything you're giving them that they're not paying you for, they're using to make money. And so it's just, a, it's just a good place to start. So I'm not interested in those two questions as they're asked. And I normally don't want to be asked them because I, they want short answers, and the short answers are not any fun. And that's another reason you're lucky, is that universities and, and the academic context is the context of where you can get the truth, because you're interested in the actual answers, 
rather than the promotional answers. And living in a world where you're actually discussing those <laughs> subjects rather than promotional ideas, gimmicks, strategies, the minute somebody says the word strategy, I start kind of shutting down, you know, like, ah, is that what life is? It's a strategy? It's not that. It's about wrestling with ideas and um, trying to be as honest to uh, yourself and your pursuit as you can be because if you start to answer those questions, inevitably, inevitably you start to believe the answers and you start to believe that's who you are. And pretty soon, you're being profoundly defined by this thing you've accepted as true. So I'm going to answer those two questions about who invented it and what, what good is it going to do. Hopefully, honestly, it's possible. And as succinctly as I can without, like, turn it into an elevator pitch, which is what we all need for promotional stuff. So, um, which one should I answer first? How did I come up with the idea? So, I didn't come up with the idea. Um, I'm a sculptor, and the, most of the time that I lived in Ithaca, I worked on sculptures. The sculptures um, that, I'm, that I'm most known for are, are large-scale abstractions based on birds that have been driven to extinction in modern times. And I placed them at the places where the birds were last seen in the wild. And I was motivated to do that because I was working in the studio. This is, this is relevant to how things are invented. I was working in the studio on an abstraction that was based on a preening duck. Well, a preening duck is, is, is like a nod to Rodin's Eve, which is a, Rodin, a, a nod to classical sculpture. It's easy to find some sort of historical lineage to that motivation to make this preening duck. But it's a duck, not a person, because we live in a modern time where figure sculpture is complicated. Why would you want to introduce all of that? So anyway, duck makes you free of those things. So, I'm handing a book during that period from a guy named Chris Kokinos. That's the first name you don't want to write down. And a lot more names are going to come you don't want to write down. There, it's, you shouldn't write mine down either. Um, Chris's book is called uh, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, which of course is Emily Dickinson's great poem, which of course is another name you don't have to write down. So Chris wrote a book with a title from Emily Dickinson talking about an extinct bird that I read while I was making sculptures. And Consequently, when I went back to the studio, it seemed like I should make a monument to lost birds. And that's how that got started. And doing that, a, a friend of a friend knew this woman named Muffy Meyer. Another great name, you don't have to write it down. Muffy's awesome. And she called me and she said, I like your story. Would you consider us following you around on a project to make a documentary film? I said, oh, that's great. Well, Muffy then got another job working on a film about Dolly Madison. I'm sure you've heard about her, but you don't have to write her name down either. I'm going to stop saying that. Yeah. Um, so uh, she went off to work on a Dolly film, and she gave her film to a woman named Deborah Dixon, who's fantastic. Deborah Dixon then followed me around for a long time, for two years. Um, and Deborah Dixon has a partner named Scott Anger, who does all the cinematography. And Scott Anger and I became really good friends. And during all of this time, I got to talk to Scott and Deborah and Muffy about storytelling and what role narrative plays in extending meaning. And so we're adding that to sculpture. So sculpture has a certain language, then storytelling has a certain language, and film has a certain language. Scott and I spent a lot of time talking about those things. Scott also grew up surfing, and I grew up um, getting crushed by waves <laughs> near surfboards. <laughs> so uh, Scott, then, Scott started telling me stories about um, about his, his sort of surfing life, and we became close friends. And I was so moved by the um, experience that I decided I, I wanted to try to make a documentary film with Scott. And um, Scott came with great skill and experience and some funding and access. Uh, so since Scott and I had a lot of intense time to spend together, and uh, one of the metaphors that we would often use about when things, things are going badly, he would tell me a story about uh, how work that he did that sometimes totally flops because he fails to step back and ask himself the elemental question. And uh, we had, we had um, kind of ongoing shtick we could say to each other when we knew something was going wrong. Um, and it, would, it, it was social network for surfers. So we would be like in the middle of Africa, 
and with nothing to eat. Filming something completely irrelevant to the story we were trying to follow and completely messed up, and he would turn to me and say, it's kind of like a social network for surfers. And we would both laugh, and of course nobody else knew what we were talking about. And what we were talking about was that, that Scott, years before that, had tried to build a social network for surfers. And he and this guy, Benjamin Thomas, came up with this hockey puck thing you glued down to a surfboard, and it would tell the whole world where you were and what your rides were like. So at the end of your surf session, you could post up, awesome ride at Black's Beach. And in sort of real time, like, awesome idea, social network for surfers. That's like, a, if those of you, if you're not surfers, you like, that's a social network for fishermen. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is tell the rest of the world where the wave is for good. Because you're in the water, and then all of a sudden there's like 900 people walking towards you with their smartphones and a bird, a board on a different arm, and you're like, well, that's it for the day. You know, we got, I'm glad we got here at Dawn Patrol because now it's like terrible, so many people. So he's, then the problem was he invested a ton of time and a ton of money into something that he didn't ask himself the most elemental question, do surfers want a social media network? No, the answer is no. Uh, so um, it became a kind of joke in me. Um, but uh, I, was, I was riding on a plane you know, with my uh, sort of I with my brother-in-law, who also we collaborate on stuff, um, and he had his alumni mag magazine for University of Pennsylvania, and he, I took it to read, and in the, in the magazine there was this story about an oceanographer working at University of Pennsylvania named Oscar Schofield, who um, the article was all about a shortage of data for the specific research he was doing on near shore uh, coastal environments. And the, the article had a map that showed a map of all this data, but then near the shore there was no data, it was like a blackout zone. And, and I said to Andy, like, that's funny that it's the place where everybody serves that no one knows anything about, as a kind of extension of the joke about, like, nobody wants to know about it because it's, you don't want anybody there. Anyway, long story boring. We went to, um, the University of Pennsylvania met with Oscar. And, he, and, and in that meeting, uh, Oscar said, um, and I said, isn't it funny, thought that's where all the surfers are sitting, is where you need data, you know what I mean? He said, yeah, we, if only those guys could collect data. So, uh, and that, that was like, I called Scott afterwards, and I said, what is your hockey puck do? You know, the jokey hockey puck that everybody wants, what does it do? And, um, it didn't do anything, and I, then I sent that to Scott, to Oscar. Oscar said, that doesn't do anything that I need it to do. What I, needed, what I need data for is temperature, predominantly. I need temperature, really accurate temperature. I'm like, can't you just go with a thermometer? It's like, no, it's the surf zone. It's an aggressive zone. There's no place to put sensors. It's rugged. You put them there, they get beat up. Um, why, he explained why it's hard to get temperature data. So then I called Benjamin who was Scott's buddy that invented the hockey puck, and I said, can you make us a fin that has temperature on it? He said, yeah. No, I said, can, I, can you make me a hockey puck that has temperature on it? He said, yeah. Okay, so we had one, this hockey puck thing. So then I met this woman, uh, Shannon Waters, real name, um, who's, the, who's one of the directors of Surf Rider, and I brought the hockey puck to a meeting, and Shannon said, no one's gonna surf without a nasty thing on your surfboard. So what are we gonna, what are we gonna do? And Shannon said, you know, if we could figure out a way to integrate it into the, the gear, we'd be all set. How about the leash? So your leash to, to go to, and I said, leash, a womp order. That's, if you were, if you were, um, if you were a surfing crowd, you would have laughed when I said that. Um, because long, long boarders walk out to the end of their board. And if you're on a 10 foot board, you walk 10 feet because you're starting in the back and you walk 10 feet out to the front of the board. That means you'd have to have a 10 foot leash your board leashes are like, okay, do you, any, any of you guys um, do like um, fixed gear bikes? Fixed bike. I'm trying to think of, you know, like there's, if you ride a fixed gear bike and someone says, I'm thinking about putting a brake on it, you go, ooh, like, that's disgusting. Like that's, so like a leash on a longboard, that's nasty. Like it takes you totally out of the soul sport. Like, so what are you gonna lose your board? You know, it's like a kickstand or something. It's like, no, <laughs> it's, that's not something we've done. So, um, the, only, the only other thing that's on a surfboard that comes on are offer fins. So I uh, said, so, well, what about fins? And then I went to, um, I started then looking 
and I got a lot of no's from the, 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 from the engineers I was working with. The, the, the fin's too small, it's not going to work. So I had, to, I had to up it, right? So I went to Scripps, Center of Oceanography, and this, you're not going to believe this one, but this is true. I went in, I went in the, I made an appointment, I went met with the director of the near shore. His name is Andres Anderson, he's a funny, fantastic guy. And he said, uh, he said, that's funny because a guy just graduated here who did his PhD on adding sensors to surfboards for near shore oceanography. I'm so who's that guy? He said, oh, that guy's name's Phil Bresnahan. He's, he's got a job with the EPA. He'll never come back. I said, no, he's going to come back. you got to call him. So we called him, and he said, oh, my God, I'd come back in a minute. Are you kidding me to work on that? What do you call it? What are you calling it? I said, I don't know. Smart fan? And he said, oh, that's awesome. I'm coming. So then he came back, right? So he's, I, hopefully you're starting to get why who invented it is not a good question. It's a, it's a terrible question to ask these days. Um, it, it's... it's um, and then, and then if, if the camera's ever pointed at you and somebody asks you that question, don't say I did. Figure out how else to say it. You know, I, don't, I haven't figured it out, but if you can, it'd be a great thing. Figure out how to be succinct about this was a collaborative activity. Um, ideas come from many places. The challenge is to be open to the possibility of making connections that make things happen. And that's why you're lucky. You're in a program that's about making connections between things that can make things happen. And there's that word thing again. So there's a thingy in here. Uh, uh, full disclaimer: I learned how to. I learned how to. I learned Fortran. It's still a thing, right? You, does people do people still know what Fortran is? It's not a thing anymore. It's not a code. It's not a language. Nobody learned Fortran in computer science anymore. It was the first computer language. We punched our own cards by hand. We stood in line with a stack of paper cards to feed our program into the one and only computer on the campus. I love that story. Right? It's another one. They say that to programs, and they're like, what? Is that right? If they got wet in the rain because it was raining while you were weeding, it might not run right. Or if you just had a hanging chat, it wouldn't run. Crazy. That's it. That was it right there. That was my one and only computer science class. Um, I, I don't know a lot about what's in here, and I don't, I don't really need to know very much about what's in here. Um, my job on SmartFin is to try to connect the dots um, to make things happen that are already in the flow of it. And that's one of the brilliant things about documentary film, is everyone on documentary film teams knows. There's a hierarchy for sure, but everybody knows they can't do it alone, uh, and they don't try. And uh, that breaking down of silos between areas and that discipline is an inspiration to me. Um, to make these guys my collaborators. These are the, um, these are the pilot surfers in San Diego um, for SmartFin. These are the pilot scientists for San Diego. You can't really see their faces, but yes, they all have long, shaggy, blonde hair. <laughs> um, they are all, in fact, doing this, which is a real thing. Every time a camera comes out, they, this is done. It's incredible to me that it's a real thing without irony. Um, they're surfer scientists. Scripps is a blast. Every office has boards in it. Every office has a wetsuit hanging over the rail. Every office has a view of the ocean. If someone had told me you could go to college there, I would, I would have walked there from New York to go to college there. It's the most amazing place. And in the what does it do category, um, so those surfers were all had smart fins on, and the black dots are the temperature dots from smart fin, at the, and they're surfing off the script's pier. And the blue line is the temperature reading off the pier. They, that's the, uh, they've been taking temperatures for 75 years off the pier at Scripps. It's the oldest record of ocean temperature in the world. And um, as you can see from the black dots, our, our, our smart fin readings are way more accurate. Uh, the range is more accurate. And um, so this was sort of this proof of concept. We, we knew we were onto something. Uh, the other thing is they cost about 200 bucks to make each one. And they're quite small and can be distributed worldwide. And there's a super hungry audience for them. Um, if you're feeling pure or feeling cynical, uh, offer something for someone to do that they believe will do some good. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. If somebody gives you the opportunity to do something where you feel as though you're participating and adding, 
people are all over it. It's incredible. There's a hunger to do something. It's, it's why like it's not that hard to cajole people into recycling. You just give me something to do. I'm ready to do something. Which is contrary to what, I mean, you're probably the only one that knows. Right? Maybe you all know the, I can't remember the guy's name from Fast Time in Ridgemont High, which was a film that should be you know, on everybody's, you guys should all have just seen that film. We'll arrange that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the guy's, there's a surfer in there, you know, there's a scene where he's hitting his head with a pair of vans, um, and he's like, you know, like, surfers don't care about anything. They actually, be surprised. Um, and the other gulf that's waiting is that um, information is horrible. Look at this thing. <laughs> this is what Noah puts out to try to educate the general public about um, coral bleaching. That's not going to work. That just doesn't work. You know what works? These guys standing on the beach with a blinking fin and other people walking up to them and saying, why is your fin blinking? And they say, I'm taking temperature. And the person who asks says, what for? And the next thing you know, you're in a conversation about coral bleaching. And the person who hears it learns something about coral bleaching. They want to get a fin. They're going to get more data. And those are the lines that connect things to make them worth spending your time on. Um, I, I want to show you this just because this, um, so what, in the, in, the letting, in, the, in the making it possible for other people to have their place on the stage of who invented SmartFin, I make little video videos of my collaborators. This guy's name is Fola Akinola. He's a graduate from Cornell. I met him when I, when I worked here. I always really liked him, and afterwards I hired him. And um, Fola does data visualizations for the SmartFin project. My name is Fola Akinola. I'm a senior designer at the Lost Bird Project, and I've been doing a lot of data visualization for the SmartFin project. I receive data from the fins, and I turn that into images that are interactive. On the left side, we've got a data file for the month of September. And as you can see, it's just a lot of data. What I do is bring them into this form. So here we have all of these data points around the San Diego area. We hover over this one, you can see the ride. If you click on that point, it'll bring up a temperature graph. For the person just coming to SmartFin and wondering, what does SmartFin do? What is this data that these people are, are collecting? I think this illustrates that a lot better than the raw data. taking all of these long lists of data and turning them into points on a map and seeing what those rides look like definitely makes me want to go surfing. It's always really helpful to go out to San Diego. It's also a nice break from, from New York. I have never surfed before. I do not consider myself a strong swimmer. I sink like a rock. <laughs> Thank you.